I'm going to go kind of backwards. I'm going to do the bottom two first just because I might need to erase and create more room for those top ones. So three and the other three, apparently, um, three and four, um, I asked you to graph those. The first one, three, relatively simple. That's what we've been doing. We graph using a y-intercept of zero, two. That'd be right there and a slope of negative three-fourths. So from that point, we go down three and over four to get a second point. And so our line goes through those two points. Any questions on graphing that line? Okay, now the, didn't ask you to write the equation, but it'd be really easy to write that equation. Remember, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. That would turn out to be simply y equals negative three-fourths times x plus two. It's just the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. The second one over here is a little different. We didn't really do anything like it, but it's not terribly difficult to do from what we know. Instead of having a y-intercept, we have a point that it goes through at 5, 1. So we can put that there. And the slope of 2 fifths from that point, we go up 1, 2. And we run over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's our second point. And our line goes through those two points. Looks something like that. Any questions on that one? Now this one, if we graphed it carefully enough, we'll find that that y-intercept is actually at zero, negative one. So you could write that equation as y equals two-fifths x minus one, because it's a negative one. That again is the slope-intercept form of those equations for both of them. This one, however, since we're given a point rather than a y-intercept, it might have been simpler to use the point slope form. In a review of the point slope form from yesterday, remember that is where we had y minus y1. Well, the initial coordinate for y is 1 there, so we put 1 in there, equals m, which is our slope, so 2 fifths, times x minus x1, which is the initial x coordinate to that point which is five. So that would be, I'm gonna erase this axis so that's a little clearer. Y minus one equals two fifths times X minus five. When we talk about graphing at some point, that form gets changed around a little bit and it sometimes gets altered to look a little bit like this. We add the one to both sides. So it becomes Y equals two fifths x minus five and then plus one. You can see that that's an equivalent equation, but it messes things up a little bit because instead of being minus y1 and minus x1 here, this is minus x1, but this is plus y1 because we moved it over to the other side. Not something we're gonna deal with now, but a little bit of foreshadowing for about week seven or eight here when we talk about graphing higher order equations. All right, so back up to the first two. Find the equation of a line with a slope of two-thirds through the point six, one. Now remember, there's two different forms of the equation. We have that slope-intercept equation that is what we're probably the most familiar with, we've worked with the most, but we also have that point-slope that we talked about down here. I'm going to start out by doing a slope-intercept equation. So slope intercept, remember is y equals slope times x plus the y intercept. So we'll put in the slope, y equals two thirds x plus b. And the equation must be true at that point, six one. So we put one in for y. 
6 in for x, and we solve for b. Two thirds times six is four. We subtract four to get negative three equals b. So that equation becomes y equals two thirds of x minus three. How many of you had that one? Okay, good. If we wanted to do that point slope form, it becomes a little simpler. The point slope form, again, we just take the slope and that initial point and we fill it into our equation. So it's simply going to be y minus y1, which is just 1 in this case again, equals the slope of 2 thirds times x minus x1, which is just 6. So it's a lot quicker to write that equation. It's just the slope intercept form, having it like this is the way we're used to having it to graph it. We showed yesterday how we convert back and forth between them. I'm not going to go through that right now. Number two is one that we did not see yesterday, but it's really not any more difficult than what we did because we're given the information. We just have to do one process before we have the, the information we used yesterday, and that is find the slope. Anytime we have two points, we can find the slope. M equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's find that slope. I'm going to label this point 1 and 2. What goes on the top of my, my formula here? 1 minus 3, good. And that's going to equal... That's right, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. What goes on the bottom? 6 minus 2, which is 4. So we get a slope when we reduce that of negative 1 half. So now we can proceed in either of the, the forms of equations. We're going to do both. Um, y, the slope-intercept form, y equals negative 1 half x plus b. It does not matter which point we choose. Both of them are going to give us the same y-intercept. So it doesn't matter whether you use 2, 3, or 6, 1. I'm just going to use the 2, 3. What goes in for y? 3 equals negative 1 half times 2. And then, of course, plus b. So we have... Negative one half times two, which is negative one plus b. What do we do next? Add one. So b is four. So that means we go back up here. Y equals negative one half x plus four. Had we used the other point, we would have came up with the same thing. We would have put in 1 for y and 6 for x. 1 equals negative 3 plus b. Adding 3 would have given us 4 as well. If we use the point-slope form, this is where it gets a little more interesting. So we have our points 2, 3, and 6, 1. And we have our slope of negative 1 half. If I use the point-slope form using this first point, what's my equation going to look like? Yep. Perfect. Y minus 3 equals negative 1 half times, then in parentheses, the x minus 2. 
If I had used this point, what's that equation going to look like? Perfect. Y minus 1 equals negative 1 half X minus 6. Those look like very different equations, but they're identical. If we convert them into the slope-intercept form, we'll see that they are identical. Do that conversion, the first thing we have to do is distribute the negative one-half. <laughs> That's going to be negative one-half x. Negative one-half times negative two is a positive one. The left side over here didn't have anything to do yet. What's the final thing we have to do? Add three. And of course, when we add or subtract, we only have to do it to one piece on each side. So y equals negative one half x plus four, which is what we had before. Over here, where do we need to start? Distribute the negative one half. Negative one half times x is negative one half x. Negative one half times negative six. Positive 3. Of course, we have the y minus 1. Final step there. Oops, careful. There we go. We want to get the y by itself, so we add 1. So y equals negative 1 half x. 3 plus 1 is 4. So we do get the same equation. That's exactly the reason right there, Ezra, is it's so in certain cases, depending on the information you're giving, given, sometimes it's easier to find slope-intercept form. If you're given the slope and the y-intercept, it's easier to do that. If you're given the slope and just a random point on the line, then it's easier to do the point-slope form. Unfortunately, if you're going to graph, um, a lot, we're so ingrained that this slope-intercept form is a form of graphing, but we don't necessarily have to be stuck with it. So let's look at that equation, that slope-intercept form. And then look at either one of the other equations we had up there. Y minus 3 equals negative 1 half X minus 2. I can graph it from here just as easy as I can graph it from here. That was one of the reasons why I gave you the one example that I did to start off the class. Um, so this here is saying we start at positive 4. That's our y-intercept, 0, 4. Slope of negative 1, we go down 1, or negative 1 half, sorry. We go down 1 over 2. There's our second point. I kept going, down one more, over two. And I could keep going with that if I wanted to. Down one, over two, down one, over two, and we get my line going through there. This equation here is saying the same thing. I have the slope and I have the point Minus x1, so that's 2, positive 2, since it's minus 2. Minus 3 means y is a positive 3. So I start out at the point 2, 3, which is right there. And from there, my slope of negative 1 half, I go down 1 over 2. You can see I get the exact same line. It's just a different starting point. Now, if you were running into this in the, the my math lab homework of using different points. You use the, the y-intercept and the slope to find a second point, and they were looking for that, that other, uh, the x-intercept. That's why it didn't accept your answer, um, even though your line was correct. Um, it's just starting at different points. All you need is two points to make the line. It really doesn't matter which two. Okay, so... We've kind of beat the graphing lines thing to death, but I do want to do a couple more examples just to be sure. 
that we've got a sound, and then we're going to move on a little bit. So let's grab five x plus two y equals six, and we're going to graph x minus three y equals three. Obviously, we have to adjust those equations, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that while I draw out my graph, and then we'll go over them. So for these equations, both of them need to be put in graphing form. The easiest form to graph them in is that slope-intercept form. So I want them to be of the form y equals. So we need to get y by itself. So in this first one here, to try to get y by itself, what's the first thing we're going to do? Get rid of the 5x. It is positive, so we will subtract 5x. So we have 2y equals... 6 minus 5x. Now, some have been taught to do negative 5x plus 6. It's going to give you the same result. What's our next step? Divide by 2. When we multiply or divide, we have to do it to every digit on both sides. So 2y divided by 2. 2 is divided out, giving us y. What's it give us on the right side? 3. Perfect. 3 minus 5 over 2 times x, or 5 halves x. So to graph that, where do we start? There we go. Our y-intercept's at 3, so 0, 3. Down 5 over 2. Perfect. There's our second point. There is our line. Number two, where do we start at? We subtract the x from each side. Good, so it's gone there. This is a negative 3y that's left equals 3 minus x. What's next? Divide by negative 3. And, of course, when we divide, we divide every piece. So the negative 3 divides out, we're left with y. What's the right side become? Perfect. Negative 1 plus 1 third x. 3 divided by negative 3 is negative 1. We think of that as a negative 1 x. Negative 1 divided by negative 3 is a positive 1 third times x. So when we graph it, where do we start? Negative 1, 0. Perfect. Or sorry, 0, negative 1 is our y-intercept. And from there, what do we do? Up 1 over 3. Good. There's our second point. There's our line. Remember what each of these lines represents. The line represents all of the possible solutions to either of these equations. Like here, there's a point right here. I follow that down, x equals 6, y equals 1. Well, for the equation that brown line comes from right here, does that make it true? Well, x is 6 minus 3 times 1. Does that equal 3? Sure does. 3 times 1 is 3. 6 minus 3 is 3. So 3 equals 3. That makes that equation true. Every point on that brown line if I found its x-coordinate and y-coordinate, it'll make that equation true. That's what that 
minus 4. Every point on the purple line will make this equation true. I have this point marked right here at 2, negative 2. If I try that in there, x equals 2, so that's 5 times 2, plus 2y becomes 2 times negative 2, does that equal 6? Well, it sure does. 5 times 2 is 10, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, 10 and negative 4 makes 6. Every point on that purple line will make this equation true. We did something similar to this on our number lines when we worked with equations like this, 3x plus 7 equals 19. We subtracted 7, 3x equals 12, and then divide by 3. X equals 4. And we represented that on a number line by simply putting a dot at 4. That represented X equals 4. We had other ways of representing that value in vectors and other stuff, but the dot is the simplest way. More, comp more interesting than just that dot on the number line, we had things that looked like this. Two x minus five is greater than or equal to nine. Now we solve this just like any other equation, but it is right now an inequality. It's saying whatever value x is, it has to make this here expression 2x minus 5, at least 9, either 9 or larger. So to solve that, to figure out what values x could be, we treat it just like an equation. We're going to get x by itself. What's our first step to get x by itself? Add the 5. 2x is greater than or equal to 14. What else did we do then? Divide by 2. Perfect. Divide by 2, x is greater than or equal to 7. And as long as we don't do anything we shouldn't, that inequality symbol right there stays the same. It doesn't move. So we graph that. Seven is, of course, right here. Is that going to be open dot or closed dot? Closed, because it equals 7. 7 is true. If x is 7, it's still true. And of course, greater than points that way. Now, I said as long as we don't do anything we shouldn't, that symbol doesn't change. What can cause us to do something we shouldn't? Well, there, there's a couple of things, and it's not that we shouldn't do it. We just got to be careful to do it. And we might have 9 minus 4x is less than 1. So to get x by itself, what would we do to start this off? Subtract 9. Minus 4x is less than negative 8. So far, nothing wrong with what we've done there. What's our next step? Perfect. We have to get x by itself. It's being multiplied by negative 4. So to get rid of it, we have to divide by a negative 4. But as you said, whenever we multiply or divide by a negative, that inequality sign has to flip, change directions. So negative 8 divided by negative 4 is a positive 2. That less than becomes a greater than. X is greater than 2. So on the same number line, we can graph that. Here's 2. Open dot or close dot? Open because it's strictly greater than. And it points in that same direction. Another spot where we can have some issues might look like this.
7 is greater than 3x minus 5. How would we go about solving that? Add the 5 to both sides. Good. So we've got 12 is greater than or equal to 3x. What's next? Perfect. Perfect. We divide by the 3, gets rid of the 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4. So 4 is greater than or equal to x. But we always want the variable first so that we know which way to do things. So we're going to basically take a mirror image of the whole thing. And the x comes first and the 4 last. It still has to point at the x. So it's saying x is less than or equal to 4. So up here on the graph, here's 4. Open or close dot? Close because it's or equal to. Right or left? Left because x is less than. 4 was greater than or equal to x, but x is less than or equal to 4. Well, today we're going to take the next step. In that combining those two skills that we just looked at, graphing lines and the inequalities, and we're going to look at what happens when we graph a two-variable linear inequality. We might have something like y is less than or equal to one-half x minus three. When we go to graph that, just like we did with the one variable ones up above here, we treat it as though it's an equals and we just graph it. We find that boundary value, if you will. These dots here were the boundary values. That was saying that one side of this dot is the solution, the other side is not, is non-solution. So, in this case, instead of just being a dot, however, that boundary is going to be a line. So, we'll treat this as y equals 1 half x minus 3. How do we graph that? 0, negative 3. Perfect. y intercepts at 0, negative 3. Then we go up 1 over 2. And our line goes through those points. Now on the number line, we just had an arrow that pointed to one side or another. Because the number line being just you know one dimensional like that, we just had to know left side or right side. Here, it's two dimensions, so we can't just point to one side. We're gonna have to shade one side in. To figure out how to which side to shade in, there are a couple of ways we can go about it. You might look at this and say, well, that is less than or equal to, so it's gonna be the bottom. But we have to be very careful with that. There are times that that can be deceiving. That's actually going to be the right spot here, but we can't just assume that. What we wanna do is use something called a test point. Where we pick a point on the graph that we know is obviously on one side of the line or the other, test it in the original inequality and see if it's true or false. If it's true, we know that's the side that the solution is on. If it's false, we know the solution has to be on the other side. If I can, if it's obviously on one side of the line or another, the test point I always choose is the origin. So zero, zero. Simply because it's really easy to calculate with zeros. So to test that point in over here, put in zero for one. Is that less than or equal to one-half? One-half x becomes one-half times zero minus three. Well, one-half times zero is zero. Zero minus three is negative three. Is zero less than or equal to negative three? No, it is not. 
So that is telling us that the solution is not, zero, zero is not in the solution. And zero, zero is on this side of the line. We have to shade in the other side, like this. So the solution to this linear inequality is simply that, that line with the bottom side shaded in. Now, I chose that one to start out with less than or equal to so that my boundary was that line that we're used to making. But let's look at another one here. Y is greater than negative 2X plus 1. So again, I'm going to treat this as a line. Y equals negative 2X plus 1. How am I going to graph that line? Start at 0, 1. That's my Y-intercept. Perfect. We treat the negative 2 as a negative 2 over 1, down 2 over 1. There's my second point. Now, before I draw the line in here, remember on the number line, we had open dots and closed dots. The closed dots, if, if it was for or equals to. The open dot was if it's strictly less than or strictly greater than. Well, here, this is strictly greater than. So we have to have an equivalent to that open dot. But the open dot, remember, said is that boundary was not part of the solution, but everything up to that boundary was. The equivalent for a line is rather than doing a solid line, we do a dashed or dotted line like that. Pretend that line is straight. That's our boundary because it is strictly greater than it has to be a dashed line so it's telling us the points that are on that line are not in the solution but every point that leads up to that line from the shaded side is in the solution so now we have to figure out which side to shade here's a case where zero zero is not necessarily clearly i mean yeah if you look close it's mostly it's on this side of the the line but I'm maybe not too comfortable with that. So maybe I'll pick a point over here, like negative 5, 0, and I'll test that. So let's put that in. That would be y equals 0 when x is negative 5. Negative 2 times negative 5 is 10. And 10 plus 1 is 11, right? Is that true? Is 0 greater than 11? It is not. So that means that the solution is not on this side. It is on the other side. So we will shade in. The other side of the line. Like that. Any questions? Well, there is, but we have to be very careful with it. Um, y is greater than, greater than, what the y is greater than, well, that's this end of the y-axis. So, yeah, we would shade the, the part of the line that contains that end of the y-axis, which would be above the line. In a line this steep, above and below are a little foggy, but you can still make it out. So yes, you can do that, but it is always safer to use a test point because we're going to run into examples where negatives come into play and they can cause some issues for us. But yes, if you do everything carefully when you're doing your calculation, you're absolutely right, Jesse. There, You can just look at the less than or greater than and graph off of that. So let's do something. 2y minus 5 is less than 
3x plus 1. So obviously right now this is not a line. We have to do something to adjust it so that we can, we can graph it. Um, well, it is a line, I should say, but it's not in graphing form. We want to get y by itself. So what are we going to do to get y by itself? We start out by adding 5. Remember, when we add or subtract, we only have to do it to one piece on each side. So we're going to add just to the 1 on the right side. So 2y is less than 3x plus 6. Then what do we do? Divide by the 2 to get rid of the 2. So y equals? Three over two x plus three. Good. And I shouldn't have said y equals. It still is y is less than three over two times x plus three. So when we graph this, where do we start? Zero three. Good. That's three. That zero three is our y intercept. From there, where do we go? Up three over two, right there. Solid line or dashed line? Dashed or dotted line, yes. Because it is strictly less than, that means the boundary is not included in the solution. Now again, as you said, Jesse, that says less than, we're assuming we're going to shade in the bottom side down here, but let's make sure. Zero, zero is obviously below the line, so let's double check and see if that makes the original inequality true. So two times y becomes two times zero minus five, less than three times x, well, x is also zero, so that's three times zero plus one. 2 times 0 is 0, so we just have negative 5 on the left side. 3 times 0 is 0, so we just have 1 on the right side. Is negative 5 less than 1? Yes, that is true. So that means this point is true. So that confirms that we are going to shade in the bottom side. Now, I didn't try to pull anything tricky on you on that one. So, yes. Just looking at that saying it is strictly less than, it works. That does tell us which side to shade in. But we can run into something like this. Four X minus three Y is greater than or equal to six. To graph that, we have to get it into that Y equals form for the line. And typically, the way most textbooks teach it is we take out the inequality and we actually write it as an equation and solve that equation for y to get the equation, the graphing form of the equation for that boundary. And yeah, that, that makes it, it's, some people get confused by having the inequality in there. So they do that. They've turned it into the equation and then they use that. But there's no reason why we have to take the out. We can still work with that inequality. And as long as we do this and we do it correctly, your, your thing there, Jesse, of just using that less than or greater than to tell which side we're going to shade in will work. Um, the reason I said it can become an issue is if you do just put the equal sign in that place and rearrange the equation using that, well, you don't know if that inequality has had to flip at some point. And we'll show you what we mean here. So to get y by itself, what's the first thing we do? We'll subtract the 4x. Good. So we got negative 3y is greater than or equal to 6 minus 4x. Now what would we need to do? Divide by negative 3. So the negative 3 cancels out. y is less than or equal to? Negative 2 plus 4 over 3x. Good. 
And that's the key step right there. By leaving the inequality in there, we catch that we're dividing by a negative, so we had to flip it. If we use the textbook trick of just putting in an equal sign, we don't catch that. And that's why they say that you have to go back and do that test point. But from here, of course, where is that going to start at? Zero, negative two, yep. And from there? About four over three. Dotted or solid? Solid line. And that says less than or equal to. I'm guessing we're going to color in below, aren't we? Let's use our test point just to be sure. Zero, zero is obviously above the line. So let's put it in. Always when you do, if you do a test point, always go back to the original equation or original inequality, I should say. 4x becomes 4 times 0 minus 3y becomes 3 times 0. Well, 0 times 0 is 0 and or 4 times 0 is 0 and 3 times 0 is 0. So that's just 0. Is 0 greater than or equal to 6? No, so that's not true, which means this point is not true. That confirms that we do color in this side of the equation, this side of the line. So that's really the main reason for using the test point, is to make sure that when we have those negatives that come into play, we don't mess something up. I'm going to have you guys graph one in your notes right now. Give that one a shot. So, um, let's take a peek here at what we have to do to solve this. We want to get y by itself, so what are we, where are we going to start? Minus 2x, good. What's that give us? 4y is less than 8 minus 2x. What's next? Perfect. So y is less than 2 minus 1 half x. To graph it, where do we start? At 0, 2. Good. And from there we go down 1 over 2. I'm going to do it again, down 1 over 2, just because those points are kind of close together. Solid or dashed? Dash line, yep, you say shaded. Let's do a test point. Probably guessing shaded below. Let's do the test point. Zero, zero, obviously below the line. Let's see if that makes it true. So 2x becomes 2 times 0, plus 4y becomes 4 times 0. We got 0 and 0, which add up to 0. Is that less than 8? Yeah, so that point is true. So we shade that in.
Without me doing an example, I'm going to have you guys try it. Give that one a shot. So we're going to have to distribute negative two times three is negative six, negative two times positive two y, perfect. Do I have to flip the inequality? No, all I've done is I haven't solved it. I haven't tried to solve anything. All I've done is combine on the left side. So I have not affected that inequality symbol at all. You might say, but we multiplied by negative two. We did, but we did not multiply the inequality by negative two. We just multiplied What's in that parentheses by the negative two? How do we continue from there? Add six to give us what? Two i is greater than or equal to x plus six. What's next? Divide by the two, good. get one half x plus three good so we'll start at three up one over two solid or dashed solid guesses are we going to color in above or below above that would be my guess too let's test our point here of zero zero Negative 2 times 3 minus 0, is that greater than or equal to 0? Well, 3 minus 0 is 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0. Is that greater than or equal to 0? Oops, I did something wrong there. What is 3 minus 0? 3. Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. Is that greater than or equal to 0? No, so that is not true. So we were correct. We are going to shade in above the line. There we go. I'm going to have you guys try one in your notes. If we do well on this one, um, we're going to probably knock off a little bit early today. So let's take a peek. Let's do... Negative 2 times 3y minus 2x is less than or equal to 12. I'm going to have you give that one a shot. We'll look at it in just a couple minutes, and we'll go from there.
So what's our first step? Perfect. We distribute the negative 2. What do we get? Negative. Perfect. Negative 6y plus 4x is less. There you go to 12. We have not, we just multiplied on the left side. We did not multiply the whole inequality. So we do not flip the symbol. What's next? Subtract 4x. What do we get? Perfect. Negative 6y is less than or equal to 12 minus 4x. And what's our final step? Divide by negative 6. Okay, we get? <coughs> Perfect. Since we divided the whole inequality by the negative 6, we did have to flip the symbol. So we start out at 0, negative 2, and from there we go up 2 over 3. There we go. Solid or dashed? Solid. Now our guess is we're probably going to color in the top. Let's test a point to be sure. 0, 0 is obviously above the line. Negative 2 times 3 times 0 minus 2 times 0 less than or equal to 12. Well, 3 times 0 is 0, and 2 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 0 is 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0. Is 0 less than or equal to 12? Yes, yeah, so that point is true, so we shade that side of the line. It's less than or equal to. It doesn't have to meet both conditions, it just has to meet one of the two. So what, what this means, just like when we graphed our lines, every point over here is a solution to that inequality. I can pick any point that I know is in the, excuse me, in the shaded region. Like the point here, 2, 5. That should be a solution to this inequality. F negative 2 times 3x is going to be 3 times 5. 3y is going to be 3 times 5. Minus 2x is going to become 2 times 2. And less than or equal to 12. That should make this inequality true. Let's calculate it out. It's just a matter of order of operations on the left side here. What do we have to do first? Yeah, 3 times 5 is 15. Now, technically, we should treat this as a separate step. I would probably go ahead and do it all at once, too. But 2 times 2 is 4. And then... 15 minus 4 is 11, and 11. multiply it to get negative 22. Is that less than or equal to 12? Sure is. Let's try another point. Come on now. Let's take a point right here. This point is going to be negative 3, negative 3. Now, I purposely chose that point because it's on the line. When I know that when that point's on the line, what's going to be true about this result when I put it in the inequality? Let's take a peek and see what happens. We've got negative 2 times 3 times... We said y was negative 3, minus 2 times, we said x was also negative 3, less than or equal to 12. 
So what's the first thing we have to do here? You got three times negative three is negative nine. Good. Of course, that less than or equal to 12 is still floating out there. Now, here's a case where I would probably look at this as being a negative two times a negative three, because that would be simpler for me. What would that become? Positive six. Very good. If you treat it as just two times negative three, it'd be a negative six, but it would be minus a negative six, which is the same as plus a positive six. Okay, so now inside the parentheses, we still have to combine. Negative nine and six makes negative three. Oh, I know what I did wrong. That's okay. So anyway, that line, that point wasn't on the line. Um, negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. Is 6 less than or equal to 12? Yes, yeah, so it is obviously true. That point was actually slightly above the line. The point that's actually exactly on the line would be negative 3, negative 4. I'm going to test that one in just to, to make my So y is negative 4, so this will be 3 times negative 4, minus x is negative 3. We'll buzz through this one together pretty quickly. So first thing we would do, 3 times negative 4, which is negative 12. Then we would do the 2 times... Or, I would treat it as negative 2 times negative 3, which is positive 6. Okay, and then negative 12 and 6 is negative 6. Perfect. And what's negative 2 times negative 6? 12. We get 12 is less than or equal to 12. Is that true? Yes, it is still true. That's a solid line. So points that are on the line are true. The point I was trying to make there is points that are on the line will make it true, but if they're exactly on the line, it uses the, it fits the or equal to part of the inequality. If it's off the line, like these other points we chose, the negative 3, negative 3, and the 2, 5, being off the line on the side of the solution, they were true, but they were in the less than part of the inequality is what they met. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Where it had to be the same? Oh, when we did vectors, yes. Yeah, it doesn't have to meet both of them. It, yeah, it doesn't have to meet both of them. It either be less than or equal to. It doesn't have to be both. Yeah. I forgot to ask at the beginning of class, were there any questions on the homework from yesterday? Okay, so... What we did today should match up with homework 4B. You get a chance to get started on that. Again, that's not due till next Monday, but it's recommended you have it done for tomorrow. Um, we're about 10 minutes early here, but that's okay with only two of you. We tend to fly through stuff a little quicker. Um, I'll let you guys out of here. You guys have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.